Hello. This story took place roughly one year ago now, and I am still in disbelief about the whole thing. The events left me depressed, alone, and scarred. Plus, as the old saying goes, the devil is in the detail. This holds much truth, but maybe it's time I tell my story. I is still out there, searching for me, looking for a way to escape. I can feel it as sure as sunlight on my skin on a sunny day, like a light pressure on the inside of my skull. Eyes presence, evil or whatever you want to call it, wants to get me, desperately. And it's pissed. My name is Stephen. I am a 25 year old and lived just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. I was a structural engineer working for a small private consulting firm. I designed support systems for many top companies in the US. I was a hard worker. I made really good money and was engaged to the most wonderful woman that I've ever met. Her name was Julie, but I just called her Jules. We first met at college, University of Tennessee to be exact. I was just beginning my junior year when we met at a college football game in Knoxville. I forget who our team, the volunteers, were playing. We hit it off right away and we began dating shortly thereafter. We were inseparable. It was like we were made for each other. We shared the same corny sense of humor, taste in music and literature, and just about everything else. By the time we graduated, we were deeply in love. We both were native Nashvilleans. She grew up in a town named Franklin, and I in a town called Bellevue. Both were suburbs of Nashville. She returned to Franklin and moved into a small one bedroom apartment there. When I graduated, I managed to get a position in the aforementioned structural engineering firm. The money was wonderful so I could afford to move closer to work in a very nice two bedroom apartment in Brentwood. Jules would spend the weekends at my apartment on most occasions and I at hers during others. Whatever was more convenient. It was my apartment mainly because of Jojo, my dog. She was a seven year old lab husky mix and was my best friend other than Jules, of course. Jules' apartment complex wouldn't allow pets, so sometimes we'd sneak her over there when we could. Jojo was loyal, quiet, and cute as hell. She was the best dog I've ever had. At my apartment complex, my neighbors were a really cool couple who quickly became Jules and my best friends. Whenever my work allowed, we'd all hang out in the pool in the middle of the complex, grill out, drink beer, and generally joke around. The girls would often go out on shopping sprees while he and I would play video games, listen to music, or watch movies that the girls didn't want to watch. In general, we were all the best of friends. And this continued for a year until they dropped a bomb on Jules and I. They were moving to another state. He had gotten an incredible job offer in Texas. It was his dream job, so I can't really blame them for leaving. We were just heartbroken. Honestly, the move date was only a few days away, so we had very little time to make the most of it. Jules and I 
gladly help them pack their belongings and load it into the U-Haul truck they acquired. Tears flowed as they left. Texas, damn. No way we'd get enough time to visit them there with Jules and my work schedules. We all promised to keep in touch, and for a while we did. But, like everything else long distance, we eventually grew apart, until we only spoke a few times a year. Right about that time, everything fell to shit. I had gotten home from work early on a Tuesday, not two weeks after our friends had moved out, when I discovered a large rental truck parked just outside of the entrance to my building. The rear loading ramp was down, and as I walked past it, I noticed it was mostly empty. Whoever was moving in had been there a while, and judging by the size of the truck and how empty it was, there was no sign of anyone. Whoever was moving in had been there a while, judging by the size of the truck and how empty it was. There was no sign of anyone, though. I had a bad feeling just then. I don't know how to describe it, other than apprehension. It was like the feeling one gets when they see a particularly dark thunderstorm on the horizon. I don't know why I had this feeling. Nothing seemed amiss. And hell, I hadn't even met any of these new people yet. But it was there. I just shrugged it off and walked to my apartment. Now, the layout to my building was this. It's a two-story decorative building with 16 units in each. There are two entrances both top and bottom floors on each face of the building. On each entrance, there are four ground floor units and four upstairs units. Each apartment door was on a 45 degree angle to the hallway. So you can easily see the other three apartment doors using the peephole in my door. As I approached my apartment, my apprehension peaked when I noticed my former neighbor's door propped open by a cardboard box. Shit. New neighbors already? It's always a worrisome time when the new replaces the old. How are these people going to be? Quiet or noisy? Kept or unkept? Intelligent or uncouth? You never really know until they've moved in and spent some time there. I would just have to wait and see, I guess. I couldn't see anything inside the apartment, but I could hear what sounded to me as thrash metal music playing somewhere inside. Great. Most likely young kids. And young kids usually meant parties and wild times. I wasn't normally a judgmental type, but I did have experience. And my experience was telling me to watch out. I was thinking all of this and unlocking my door when I heard a woman's voice approaching. Uh, don't worry about it. Just leave it in the kitchen and I'll unpack it later. Just then, a woman came through the doorway and Lord Almighty, she was beautiful. She seemed to be in her early to mid twenties, tall, curvy up top, and had a rack of thick, and curly black hair that fell past her shoulders. She was obviously into the gothic scene because she was wearing a long, tight-fitting black lacy dress that had two thin straps over her shoulders and fell to just above her feet. Not exactly moving garb, I suppose, but whatever. She was wearing black lipstick and had porcelain white skin and black mascara. She was stunning. I couldn't remember ever seeing a more perfect representation of a woman than her. Sorry, Jules, but I know I'm not the most perfect guy in the world either. She rushed out of her doorway and nearly ran into me. She let out a surprised, oh, and stepped back. 
I stuck up my hand and introduced myself, all the while feeling a little awkward. She looked annoyed. I wasn't gawking at her or anything like that. I was completely loyal to Jules, and I had my engagement ring on, so there couldn't be any confusion there. You almost ran into me, lady. What the hell? She gave me an obviously forced smile and said, Oh, uh, hey, what's your name? Stephen, I replied, smiling and trying to be as friendly as I could without being too weird. Stephen, okay, I'm Jess. She took my hand and gripped it pretty tightly, more tightly than I would have thought appropriate. I noticed a lot of odd silver rings and whatnot on her thin fingers and hand. Her nails were jet black and had little intricate designs painted on them with a dark red colour. I couldn't identify all the rings, but the one I did get a look at was a serpent coiled around the upper part of her index finger. Wow, this chick was really into the whole goth thing. She must have spent all her money at Hot Topic, I thought. Nice to meet you, Jess. I wanted to ask her if it was just her moving in, or if she had family, a boyfriend, husband, whatever moving in as well. But she never gave me the chance. Uh, my rental truck is due back in an hour. Nice to meet you, Stephen. And with that, she rushed off. Her tone had an element of disdain to it. She seemed off. I couldn't put my finger on it. Okay, so she was busy and on a tight schedule, I get it. But I sensed something was seriously off about that woman. I made a mental note to tell Jules about it later. I unlocked my door and walked in. Normally, Georgia would be there to enthusiastically welcome me home, but not today. Strange. I called out her name and nothing. I walked into the living room and didn't see her. My coffee table was large, heavy, and rather low to the ground, except that it wasn't quite as low as it looked like from the outside. The bottom was just high enough off the floor that Jojo could crawl underneath it when she was scared. So I checked, and there was no Jojo. Jojo? Where are you, pumpkin? I checked the kitchen. Nothing. Bathroom and second bathroom. Nothing. I finally found her, huddled under my bed. Okay, now that is strange. She never went under my bed except for when we were playing. And even then, she wouldn't stay there for more than a few seconds. Her favourite hiding spot was always under the coffee table in the living room. What you doing under here, sweetie? I asked as I got down on the floor to try and coax her out. She pressed herself all the way up against the wall, where the headboard is. Her head was resting on her paws, but when I reached for her, she began to wag her tail. She slowly crawled out from under the bed. I knelt down next to her, and began to pet her. She seemed to perk up a bit after that. What's got you acting so odd? I thought to myself. She had never acted like this, even when there was a thunderstorm crashing outside. Could it be the noise the new neighbors were making and their metal music cranked up? I honestly had no idea. Looking back on this now, it really was my first warning. Of course, I could never have imagined what was coming at this point, but a red flag was a red flag, and I should have paid more attention to it. Come on, let's go for a walk. I connected the leash to her collar and took her outside. She stopped just out front of the door for a moment and sniffed deeply. She looked in the direction of Jess's door, which was now closed and huffed the way only a dog could. She whined for a split second, 
and then turned and went to the front of the building where the grass was. Later that night, I told Jules all about what happened. She agreed that it was strange, but being the bright soul she was, she thought it wasn't much more than some new smells from next door that upset her. Plus, moving was a noisy business. That too probably added to Jojo's stress. Whatever the reason, we both chalked it up to nothing much to worry about and went on about our conversation about our days. Three days later, Jules came over to my apartment for the weekend, which was quite normal now. We watched a movie from Netflix and ordered a pizza. After the show, we were cleaning up our mess when we heard something. It was a low hum and rather hard to hear, but it was there. It took us a few minutes to figure out it was coming from next door. We could really hear it in my bedroom. We put our ears to the wall adjacent to the next door bedroom, and it was hard to disconcern, but it sounded a lot like chanting. Jules and I both stood with our ears pressed to the wall and listened for a while. It was definitely voices in some kind of chant. At first, I thought it was some thrash metal music that I had heard a few days before. But it kept on going and going. What the hell? We could hear what the voices were saying, but they were all male voices. Dark, monotonous and creepy. It came obvious the chanting wasn't coming from a movie or TV show. Maybe a video game? Perhaps. But it wasn't like any game I'd ever played, and I'd certainly played a lot in my time. It was the kind of sound that once you discovered it, you couldn't stop hearing it. Jaws wasn't too happy with sleeping in a room with chanting, so we decided to sleep in my spare bedroom. Jaws and I made love and fell asleep. We woke up the next morning to Jojo barking at the front door. Nothing loud, just woofing, and growling in a low tone. Jules asked if Jojo had ever done that before, and I said no. Well, something sure has it addled, said Jules, looking a little perplexed. I know, she's been acting weird ever since Jess moved in. Animals can be a good judge of character. I doubt she's a serial killer. I said this as I got up from bed, and went into the bathroom down the hall. Well, if she is, tell her I want you stuffed in a sexy pose, please. I just laughed and closed the bathroom door. When I came out, Jaws was in the kitchen making breakfast. Jojo was laying at her feet. Something was upsetting Jojo like crazy. She kept staring at the front door all the time now. She wouldn't take her eyes off it. If Jaws and I were in the living room, Jojo would be under the coffee table with her eyes fixed to the front door. If she was in the kitchen, her view was locked on the front door again. She just wasn't herself. New smells and sounds wouldn't account for this behaviour. I was starting to suspect something bad was happening, and Jojo had fixated on it. Whatever the case, I'd have to keep an eye on her and the new girl next door. Sunday eventually came, and Jules had to return home to get ready for the work week. I kissed her goodbye, and watched her drive off in her white Nissan Altima. Everything was normal throughout the late afternoon and into the evening. I was playing Grand Theft Auto V online with some friends of mine, when Jojo started barking again. I took my earphones off to tell her to stop when I heard it. The chanting. It was back. I went into my bedroom to get a better listen to it. I put my ear to the wall and I heard, well, the male chanting was the same as before. But now there was an obvious female voice going along with it. No, wait. That wasn't right. It was moaning. 
moans of pleasure during sex. It was a pleasurable moan for sure. Were Jess and these men having a group orgy? I kept listening for a while and heard the voice climax and then stop. The chanting ended too. And then nothing, nothing at all. I thought about calling Jules and telling her about what had happened, but it was past midnight and I knew that she would already be asleep. No. I'll tell her about it tomorrow. Just then, Jojo came to me with that I gotta go pee look that she always gave me when it was time to relieve herself. Okay, fine. I got her leash and took her outside. Jojo stopped and looked at Jess's front door, whined a little, and turned to go out front. She walked around sniffing for a bit and decided on an acceptable spot and peed. When she finished, I began to take her back in. Just as I rounded the corner to the hallway, I heard a door open and several voices trailed out. It was Jess's front door. Men came out dressed in black gothic garb. They said their goodbyes and walked past me. There were six in total. As I approached my door, I caught a glimpse, Jess. As I approached my door, I caught a glimpse of Jess standing just inside her door. She was wearing a dark red bathrobe. Her hair was disheveled and she looked drained. They did have an orgy. I have got to tell Jules about this. I casually pulled the keys out of my pocket to unlock the door when Jess and I made eye contact. I smiled and said good evening. She looked at me for a second without saying a word. Jojo started her now recognizable low growl again and Jess's eyes slowly rolled down to stare at Jojo. She stood there, looking at my dog like she was about to murder it. Jess then leaned forward just a bit an almost imperceptible motion. Jojo started to whine and laid down behind my legs away from her. Jess looked back up at me. She quickly closed and locked her door. That woman was starting to make me nervous. We went inside my apartment and I unleashed Jojo. She immediately went to the coffee table and crawled underneath. She was shaking and whining. For the first time, I started to get angry. What the hell was going on here? What am I seeing? Why is Jojo so afraid of that girl, Jess? What is up with all that chanting in the orgy? I had so many questions and no answers. And I had no idea on how to get them either. I went inside and prepared for bed. And as I was laying in bed, I kept thinking about all of these strange events. The next day, I told Jules about what had happened, and she was just as perplexed as I was. Everything seemed to return to normal, except for Jojo's behavior. At least, there were no further instances of that creepy chanting. Things took a turn for the worse about a week after the orgy incident. I had to work late that day, and when I returned home, it was pretty dark. As I walked up to my front door, I discovered Jojo laying on the ground. Someone had entered my apartment during the day, and Jojo had gotten out. I was furious. I checked the lock on my door to find the handle locked, but the deadbolt wasn't. My first thought was that maintenance had entered my unit to either check or work on something. Every time they'd come in before though, management would leave me a note on my door beforehand, stating the date which they would come and the reason for it. But there was no notice on my door. Perhaps it had come off. Management wouldn't tape it to the door. Just fold it and wedge it in between the door and the frame. 
I took a quick look around and found nothing. Jojo was starting to whine, so I opened my door and we both went in. I took inventory of my belongings and found nothing missing or out of place. It was at this point too late to call management, so I would have to wait until morning. I planned to unleash holy hell upon those managers for letting my dog out and not properly locking my door. I made the call first thing, and of course management said they hadn't entered my apartment. They had no repair requests, and maintenance denied going in too. So, was it a break-in? Maybe, but nothing was stolen. Everything I owned was still secured inside my apartment. Because of that, I decided not to call the police. I was still creeped out, but I didn't think it was a big deal. The next morning I took a shower and got ready for work. Jojo was in the living room, hiding under the coffee table. I knew this because I always close and lock the bathroom door when I shower. Jojo had a bad habit of climbing in with me. And I really hated that. Wet dog first thing in the morning is something to avoid. Trust me. I noticed a blast of really cold air hit me while I was inside the shower. I could see the hot water steam like crazy in the coldness. Within seconds, the whole bathroom was filled with mist. The air conditioner was set to auto and could never have created that kind of cold even on the lowest setting. I got goosebumps, it was so cold. What the hell? I toweled off and got out. I slipped my boxers on, and as I stood, I noticed something on the mirror. With all of the mist, the mirror had fogged up pretty heavily, so it was easy to see. On my mirror was a handprint. As I examined the handprint closer, I realized it wasn't a human print at all. First, it was way too big to be a person's hand. The palm was too wide, and the fingers were grossly extended outwards. Each finger measured about six to eight inches long. They were too thin as well. The second thing I noticed was no condensed water droplets running down the mirror from the print. Whenever a mirror is fogged up, touch it and you'll see what I mean. Water will condense and run down the glass, making clear little trails down it. This handprint didn't have any. Suddenly I heard a whisper behind me. It was low but there and I couldn't understand any words, just the whispering in general. It sounded like several voices at once, and they were energetic, excited voices. I turned all around and found absolutely nothing. The door was still locked. My TV was off in the bedroom, and so that could not have been the source. I remained calm and tried like hell not to jump to any conclusions. Maybe Jess and her horde were doing something next door. But then I realized that while we shared a common wall with our master bedrooms, we did not with the master bathrooms. The whispering was coming from inside my bathroom. When the mind is confronted with something abnormal, it will try and explain it with the normal. If it can't do that, it will fall into denial. I stood there looking around finding nothing amiss. Work jumped into my mind, and I checked the time. Shit! I was running late! I threw on my clothes, said goodbye to Jojo, and rushed out. Yup, I got to work late. But thankfully no one seemed to notice. I loved my job, and tried to get lost in all the numbers, calculations, and drawing. But damn, that handprint and whispering would not leave my mind. I kept trying to go over it again and again and try and explain it, but failed each time. I didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, but 
so I called Jules during lunch and told her what happened. At first she didn't believe me, but after hearing the sincerity in my voice, she stopped joking and took me seriously. Of course, the first thing she jumped to was ghosts, and I immediately discounted that. She then asked me what else it could be, and I didn't have an answer. I tried so hard to explain this away with logical, scientific reasoning, but I couldn't. Nothing I came up with could explain it whatsoever. So I did the next best thing. I ignored it, pretended like it didn't happen. Denial can be a powerful thing. I was an engineer for God's sakes. I didn't believe in ghosts and superstition. That's all bullshit. Then, things started to happen that left me doubting everything I knew. Things that science and rational thinking could not account for. As the day wore on, my fear eventually was replaced with anger. I was not going to move out. I was not going to live in fear. I was not going to allow anyone to mess with me. There was no ghost or anything goofy like that in my home. I wouldn't allow it. None of that crap was real anyway. I was obviously tired this morning and half asleep while in the shower. I probably daydreamed the whispers or my mind turned the sound of water running through the shower into whispers. The handprint was obviously an old print of mine or Jules's and had gotten distorted over time. I had to be rational. They'd put me into the loony bin for thinking that there was a ghost in my house. I just needed a night of full, deep sleep, and everything would return to normal. Yes, that was it. I was too tired and exhausted. My mind was playing tricks on me. But what about Jojo? What about her behaviour lately? Probably didn't like Jess or her friends. Animals can be a good judge of character, is what Jules always said. Maybe that's right. Who knew? I was thinking about all of this when I arrived home that evening. When I pulled up, I found a carpet cleaning van parked outside of my building, with a large hose running into the hallway. I got out of the car and walked to my front door. That's when I noticed the hose running past my door and into Jess's door. What the? I've seen these guys before. Management always called this cleaning company after a tenant had moved out. My old neighbours, for instance, had called these guys to come in and clean the carpet after they'd moved to Texas. Now, here they were again. The van and the cleaning equipment were making a hell of a racket. So I decided it was safe to peek into Jess's apartment. Empty. Completely empty. Holy crap. She'd moved out in less than a month after moving in. Wow. She'd obviously jumped her lease agreement. And that was a big deal here in Tennessee. They'd go after her for sure. With nearly a year's rent unpaid. Just then, one of the cleaning crew walked out from the kitchen into the living room and saw me standing in the doorway. Can I help you with something? He was an older guy with longish hair and stubble on his chin and jaw, but his uniform was spotless. Maybe. I'm here to see Jess. Then he gave me a confused look. Uh, the woman who lives, lived here. I don't know this Jess of whom you speak. The place was empty when we got here. We were just told to clean it up. Whoever lived here must have had some vendetta against those bedroom carpets, though. As if they were trying to redefine the term ruined. We'll have to come back to gut them tomorrow. No information about where she could have gone? I asked. Nope. Oh, wait. I did find these letters. And turned and walked back to the kitchen. I followed him to get a better look. He came back with several white letters all addressed to a Jessica Tennyson? I've got a full name now, and I felt like a real detective. 
There's nothing left here except for some shit in the bedroom. The worker said, as I thanked him for the letters. What kind of shit? I asked again. We'll come and take a look. And turned towards the master bedroom. Weird shit back in here. Max is hell on carpets now. No way to get that crap out of the fibers once it gets in. Steam can't get that shit out. As we crossed into the bedroom, I saw that most of the carpets had been cut up already. Long strips had been moved to various places, with pad underneath. I could see bits of dried wax splotched all over the carpet pieces, and even the walls. Red wax. If I hadn't have known any better, I would have thought for sure that it was some kind of bloody crime scene. That's not blood, is it? I asked, pointing to a particularly wide patch of red. Nope. That's just wax. They got that shit all over in here, especially in that drawing on the floor. What drawing? I started to get that strange, apprehensive feeling again. The same feeling I got when I first spotted Jess's moving van. The guy walked over to a corner of the bedroom, right next to the common wall, and pulled back some cut carpet and pad. There on concrete was a kind of cross. A normal cross has one vertical line and one horizontal line. This one had one vertical line and three horizontal lines in the middle, one being the longest. It also had splotches of red wax and some other dark residue around it. We think that right there is blood. Not completely sure, but yeah, looks like blood to me. This was beyond weird. I got a feeling like we were being watched. No one else was in the bedroom with us, and a quick glance at the doorway confirmed that. I was really starting to get creeped out at this point. The carpet guy just looked at me as if I were supposed to say something. I was at a loss for words. Something serious was happening to me, and this strange cross seemed to have something to do with it. I couldn't get rid of the feeling of being watched either. The air was heavy like syrup. It was hot, heavy, and oppressive. I couldn't stay any more. And I told the carpet guy thanks for all his help. And I got the hell out of there. I went back to my apartment and locked the door immediately. Jojo was under the coffee table as usual. She came out and I took her for a walk. I couldn't stop thinking about that weird cross and the strange occurrence in the bathroom. I decided that I needed more information about all of this. So when Jojo and I returned, I went straight to my laptop and logged on. First things first, I wanted, no, needed to find out about that cross. I felt it was terribly important, although I didn't know why. It only took me a little while before I found out what I was looking for. The cross is called a Salem cross, or cross of Salem. It was a holy symbol used by Christians in the past, and it was also used in rituals of dark magic and even Satanism. Jess and her friends didn't look very Christian to me, so it had to be a dark magic slash Satanism thing going on here. So... What? They performed some kind of dark ritual in her bedroom? I started to laugh at that. And then I remembered all the damn chanting. The engineer part of me immediately dismissed that thought. But could it be true? Could all this weirdness be happening because of something that they did? I mean, it did all start when Jess moved in. No, it can't be. This stuff is superstition. Or was it? We live in an age of high science, for heaven's sakes. But the things I've seen and heard? I can attest that they were real, especially Jojo's odd behavior. And that weird-ass handprint on the bathroom mirror. Try as I may, I could not come up with a rational reasoning for it. Something was going on. And I couldn't deny it anymore. 
I called Jules and told her everything I had found and researched. She was always the more spiritual of us and she believed it right off. She said to be careful and to watch Jojo. She can sense things humans can't. I guess there was logic to that. I asked Jules for help and gave her Jess's full name. I also opened up the letters I found in her apartment. Nothing but adverts and bills. But one bill did have her social security number. Yes, I gave that information to Jules too. I was going to continue trying to find answers in the meantime. Later, Jojo came up to me with a I got a pee look in her eyes again. And I got up to take her out. I turned to walk around the coffee table when I took a step and heard something go snap. What was that? I looked around but didn't see anything but the living room rug, sofa and the coffee table. I got down on all fours and felt around the area I had stepped on and I felt something solid underneath the rug. I moved the coffee table to the side and pulled back the carpet to reveal a now broken shard of mirror. What the hell? I picked the pieces up and examined them. Nothing. No writing. No anything but a broken piece of mirror. I know for a fact that it wasn't mine. None of my mirrors were broken. Then how did it get there? Wait a minute. My mind raced in circles. And then I remembered the break-in. Holy shit! The mirror and the break-in had to be related somehow. Crazy as it seemed, it started to sound plausible that someone had broken into my apartment to leave this mirror shard. But why? Why would someone do that? Having a shard of glass under a heavy rug wouldn't do me or anyone else harm. Then why? Why go through all the effort? It didn't make sense. But then, None of this made any sense. I wonder if there are any more shards of mirror around my apartment though. I took Jojo for a short walk and then came back to do some thorough searching. And it didn't take me long to find more things hidden around. I found several strands of black curly hair in both bathrooms and in the living room. I didn't know anyone with long black curly hair other than Jess. Okay, so that is weird. I had never invited her in, so how did they get in here? Unless, of course, she was evolved in the break-in. And what's even stranger is those hair strands were found in out-of-the-way places, like hidden in drawers in the bathroom and behind my sofa. I found nothing behind my TV stand. The next thing I found was a very small plastic baggie taped up underneath my dining table. I'd almost missed it with my flashlight. It was quite well hidden. And when I opened it, I discovered it was filled with fingernail clippings. Gah! I did notice the nails were painted black with tiny half marks and red near the bottom of each clipping. I then remembered Jess's nails the day she moved in. They were very distinct and I had no doubt that Jess had been the one in my apartment. Jesus! I quickly expanded my search when I finally looked inside my closets. And then I found the worst, most horrible thing yet. In the hall and master bedroom closets, I found small glass jars filled with a yellowish liquid. One jar I found in the hall closet. It was hidden behind a box of old family pictures. I found two more in my bedroom closet, hidden in a gym bag, up on the top shelf. Honestly, I didn't want to open them, thinking they were poison or something. At this point, nothing was out of the realm of the possible. I took them to the hall bathroom, donned rubber gloves that I kept in the kitchen, gathered some dish towels, and steeled myself. <sighs> Here we go. I slowly twisted the first jar I found. It finally gave way and opened up with a pop. At first, I didn't know what it was, 
So I leaned closer and sniffed. And truly, I wish I had not. It was piss. Human piss. Most likely Jess's piss. Old, warm, and nasty ass piss. I put it down and retched into the toilet. After I finished puking, I quickly replaced the jar cap and tightened it as hard as I could, hoping that not one atom of that vile shit would spill out. I took the jars and put them outside on my patio, and then scrubbed my hands with as much disinfectant as I could find. I don't think I've ever been so disgusted in all my life. At this point I had had enough. I called the police. But since nothing was stolen or damaged, there really wasn't anything that they could do. I showed them everything I found in the apartment, and filled them in on Jess and her odd behaviour. The fact that she had fled from her apartment without notifying anyone was suspicious, and the police agreed. But again, there was nothing they could do at the moment. They did take a statement from me though, and since there was no clear evidence of Jess being the one who broke in, they couldn't do a thing. After all, they said, we don't know for sure that these hairs, nail clippings and urine are actually hers, or if someone else had placed them inside my apartment. I was disappointed, but I understood. I felt totally violated. They left their hair, nail clippings and urine for me to dispose of as well. What now? It was nearly midnight and I had work in the morning. I took Jojo out one more time, showered and then went to bed. I was angry, scared and pissed off in general. I texted Jules with what happened since she was already asleep, turned off the lights and laid under the covers. I was restless for a while, thinking about the whole situation. I felt so lost and confused about it all. I was exhausted and drained, so eventually I did fall asleep. I was woken some time later by Jojo jumping on my bed in absolute panic. She was shaking and whining like crazy. I tried to comfort her. When I heard the whispering again, oh God, I tried to locate where it was coming from and it wasn't in my bathroom or bedroom this time. It sounded like it was coming from the kitchen or living room. I slowly got up when Jojo freaked, jumping down and flew under my bed. I crept towards the bedroom door. I typically leave the dining room lights on during the night for Jojo. They are on a dimmer switch and I would keep it at the lowest setting. I reached my bedroom door and tried to see what was out there. It took some time for my eyes to adjust to the dim light. The whispering got louder, but there was something else to it now. I could hear people wailing. It was soft, almost imperceptible. It sounded as if several people were in my kitchen. They sounded upset, maybe, no, more like desperate, not afraid just desperate, as they were searching for something important to them. This sound shivers down my spine and into my legs. Just then, there was a metallic crash from the kitchen. It was loud, like someone had thrown a handful of forks and spoons into the stainless steel sink. The wailing became louder and something started to shuffle in the kitchen. I'd hear a step on the tile floor, and then something dragging, then another step, and the dragging again. And for the first time, I heard a single distinct voice. It continued over and over, 
The whispering and the wailing never stopped. They only got louder. I saw a dark shape slowly moving through the kitchen from where I was standing. I couldn't tell exactly what it was, but it was definitely a person, or had the shape of a person at least. The sound continued, and I heard another voice suddenly proclaim, Where are you? Then another voice, clearly a male this time, We need you. The whispering and wailing never stopped, and the sounds continued to progress. We want you. We must have you. Please. We must find you. The thing finally rounded the corner from the kitchen and stepped into the living room. It was basically right in front of me, at about 20 feet or so. At this distance, I got a good look at it, and I almost fainted. This thing stood about seven feet tall. All I could disconcern was its shape. It was black. Black, not as if in shadow, but black as in a lack of everything. Jet black. Black upon black. Unreal black. Its shape looked like someone not human tried to make a human, but didn't really know how and failed miserably. It had a long body with elongated arms. The arms were twisted and bent as if stretched and hung down past its waist. Its head was misshapen as well, looking more like a warped melon than a human head. It was cantered at an odd angle and slowly swung back and forth as if searching. The legs, like the arms, were twisted and elongated. I couldn't see any kind of feet. The legs ended in what looked to be a cloud of darkness, with tiny, like, pinpoints shooting away from it at all angles. Then it disappeared. A dark mist rolled off it, like mist on a lake during winter. The mist slowly moved away from its body and evaporated into nothingness. Must be here somewhere. Come to us. You are required. The thing stopped in the living room and began to swing that beastly head around. I took a step back. I had no words to describe what the hell I was seeing. I was in total an absolute shock and disbelief. I have never ever been so afraid in all my life. Nothing in my experiences had prepared me for the sight before me. I felt faint and nauseous. My head started to spin, and I could feel myself losing my balance. I put my arms out to catch myself from falling, and ended up pushing my bedroom door back against the wall. Oh shit. The thing swung its head around and looked directly at me. It had no eyes, but it saw me nonetheless. It lurched at me with incredible speed. It extended its malformed arms and rushed. It screamed, ah, ah, ah. Feed, consume. There were a variety of sounds, grunts, moaning, the kind that you might hear in intercourse, and others sounded agonized, as if they were in great pain. The desperation was most definitely apparent, like a population in starvation. The whole effect chilled me to my very soul. Here was death, cold, calculating death. 
Nothing but hell itself could spawn something such as this. It was evil incarnate. The thing oozed evil, like an infected follicle oozing pus. A scent of decay enveloped me, rotting death. A corpse rotting in a swamp. Vile, despicable, unholy, unclean ultimate darkness. All of this was this creature desperately trying to get to me. I screamed and slammed my bedroom door shut and locked it, as if that could keep it out. I put my back to the door and pushed hard, and it crashed into the door like a pile driver. Wood cracked and bent inwards. No! Don't leave us. Deny. Let us in. You motherfucker. Consume. We must feed. It was deafening. It took all my strength to brace the door to keep it from blasting in. Jojo was out from under the bed now, barking up a storm. She growled and dripped saliva. I'd never seen her like this before. She had known about this thing all along. She knew and tried to warn me in her own way. Jules was right. Dogs do have a special awareness that we don't as I desperately tried to keep the door shut. I noticed a small black smoky tendril sneaking out from under the door. And then more. They moved like worms after a rainstorm. Down they slithered until they touched my right arm by the door handle. It felt cold. Incredibly cold. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't. I jumped away from the door and rushed to the back wall of the bedroom, the common room. The door bent inwards like it was made of rubber, with hundreds of those tendrils waving all over the place, and it let out a loud woody crack, then exploded inwards and fell into splinters. Finally, he is ours at last. Devour him now. As it shoveled closer, I felt around for something, anything to defend myself. I felt something in my hand. It was my watch. It was sitting on my nightstand. My parents gave me that watch for graduation. It was silver and rather expensive. I loved it because it had all the planets in the solar system rotating all around it. And the face of the watch was painted like a star. Without thought, I hurled it at that thing. The watch didn't hit it. It fell into it. And the beast recoiled and screamed in terrible pain. You son of a bitch. I grabbed more things off my nightstand and threw them at the beast, but with little effect. Make him pay. Make him pay. The creature began to withdraw, Hurts. all the while shrieking a hideous scream that frightened me even more. It floated back through the bedroom doorway Hurts. and into the living room. Pain. Jojo gave chase, barking, and growled like crazy. No more. I yelled out to her to come back, but she continued on, sensing weakness in the creature, I suppose. Looking back at it now, I believe that Jojo had been so afraid for so long, when she sensed a weakness in that damn thing, she decided to attack. And it was a terrible mistake. Just as Jojo reached the living room, the dining room light flared up like a supernova, then exploded, plunging everything into darkness. I couldn't see a damn thing. 
I stood there in utter shock for a moment, and I could hear Jojo furiously barking, and that thing screaming along with the other voices. Suddenly, Jojo's barking ceased. A second later, she let out the most god-awful whine I'd ever heard in my life. When I was a child, I remember seeing a dog get hit by a car. While it lay dying in the street, it let out a similar kind of whine. But Jojo's was a hundred times worse, a thousand times worse. Hearing Jojo in such pain shook me out of my paralysis. I ran through the shattered doorway and down the hall towards the living room. There was a light switch at the end of the hall, and I turned it on, which triggered the living room lights. When I turned, the sight I saw will haunt me for the rest of my days. The thing was standing in the middle of the living room. Several of those pin tentacle things had shot out and impaled Jojo. She was on her back shrieking in terrible pain as the thing pulled it closer to itself. As Jojo drew near, the thing began to bend sharply down at the waist towards Jojo. Its arms stretched out and down and made contact with Jojo. Such energy, such life. The blackness began to envelop the hapless dog like a cocoon. More. The creature bent so far forward that its head touched, then disappeared around Jojo. As the black cocoon crept up to Jojo's upper body, her whining stopped and she lay still. Although I could still see her breathing, more of those black, coiling, worm-like things began to move out from her mouth, nose and the corner of her eyes. She slowly turned her head to look at me, with more worm things coming out of her. She looked at me, with what seemed to be an expression of, help me, but I couldn't. I was frozen in terror. I couldn't move a muscle. Her eyes suddenly collapsed in their sockets, like raisins, and her skull and muzzle began to fall inwards with a crack, as if her head was being deflated. After what seemed like an eternity, the black cocoon enveloped her entire body. The thing was almost entirely around her, except for its legs, which were still standing several feet in front of Jojo. Sounds like dry, rustling leaves came from within, almost as if someone was slurping ice cream through a straw. There was a sound like dry wood cracking, and the thing began to withdraw. What was left of Jojo was awful. Her fur, which had been thick and luxurious a minute ago, was now thin and dried out like a desert cadaver. Her eyes were gone, and the rest of her was as desiccated as an Egyptian mummy. That thing had drained all the moisture and blood out of poor Jojo, leaving nothing but dried and cracked leather. I stood shaking in absolute fear. My mind could not, would not process what my eyes were seeing. I was numb from head to feet. The world had ceased to exist for me. All that was left was a thick soup of pure fear and disbelief. I watched as the thing slowly withdrew from Jojo's corpse and stood back up upon its legs, its misshapen head turned and focused entirely on me. He is there. We must have him. The thing began to shamble towards me, its twisted arms raised and stretched. Yes. I lost it. I really did. A dark primal panic rose up from within me and took firm control of my mind. All that mattered was to get the hell out of there right now. More. 
I ran. I ran like I had never ran before. All I had on were my boxes, but I didn't care. I dove to the right of the thing as it lunged for me, and I ran out of my flat to the front door. Next to my door was a small table that I always left my keys and wallet on. I grabbed them, unlocked the door, and in a flurry, darted through it. I ran like a madman out of my car, hit the unlock button on my key, and jumped in. Cranked it over and tore out arse of there tires spinning and smoking as I left. As I was leaving, I took a quick glance at the window of my unit. The living room light was still on. Silhouetted in the glass porch sliding doors was the thing. It was just standing there watching me leave. I don't remember anything else for a while. The next thing I do remember was banging on Jules's front door. Well, I mean hammering. And I was bawling, trying to knock it down while screaming her name over and over. When she finally opened the door, she obviously looked like she'd just gotten out of bed. When she saw me, her eyes grew wide, and I darted past her and screamed for her to shut and lock the door. After a while, I settled down long enough to tell her what had happened. I described the thing, how it had attacked me and what it did to poor Jojo. Now I'm an engineer. I am sane, logical and down to earth at all times. Her seeing me as I was made her believe me all the more. She started crying when I told her about Jojo. I hugged her like my life depended on it and we sat there for a while on her sofa just holding each other while I cried and cried and wept for what seemed like hours. The adrenaline rush evaporated away, and I was left shaky, sullen, and exhausted. By this time, it was nearly sunrise, so she called into work and told them that she wasn't going to make it in that day. She leads me by the hand into her bedroom and puts me to bed. I was a mess. I was tired and weak, and still sobbing like a child. She lay down next to me and held me until I finally fell asleep. When I awoke hours later, I was alone in the bedroom. Jules had left the door open, so I came out into her living room and she was there, sitting on her sofa. Her legs were curled up under her with her laptop sitting on a pillow on her lap. She looked up at me and smiled. Seeing her like that made my heart burst with joy and love. Thank God for her. She was my whole life, my whole love. She was my entire universe. And I'd never thought so thankful for someone in my life. She said there was coffee in the kitchen, but I didn't want any at the moment. I sat down next to her and she asked me how I was doing. I felt empty upstairs. I was still numb from my ordeal, both physically and emotionally. But I was better thanks to her. She began to tell me that she had spent the rest of her morning, after I'd fallen asleep, researching the paranormal. I was still numb from my ordeal, both physically and emotionally. But I was better thanks to her. She did find some things that seemed pertinent to my experience. The mirror shard, hair, nail clippings and urine seemed to come from the belief that in dark magic and Satanism, a dark entity could be fooled into haunting another person by tricking it with pieces of the summoner's own body parts and owned objects. That would explain what I found in my apartment. She also went on to say, that could explain what I found in my apartment. She also went on to say, that while she couldn't find anything specific to what I described to her about the thing, the closest she could find was something called shadow people. 
The lists of those were wide and varied, she said, and it was what fit the most, although nothing fit exactly with what the thing was. She also said, shadow people could take on different forms depending on who actually saw them. She said that she had read an article from Europe about a case where several people in a pub had seen a shadow person, but each had a different description of it. After reading all this, I think I have a theory. What if that Jess girl was a satanic high priestess and those men you saw were her coven? If that's right, then they could have performed what is basically called a raising ceremony. That's where they try to raise a demon or spirit from hell to do their bidding. And yes, sex is a big part of it. That would explain all the chanting and the orgy you described. That shit is all part of the ceremony I read about. It would also explain that Salem cross too. So what if they actually did raise something, but realized it was too powerful for them to control? What if this demon or dark spirit or whatever tried to go after them? If that was the case, then Jess and her coven broke into your apartment and left those things of theirs to throw the demon to you, then hightailed it out of there while the getting was good. It does make a lot of sense. But why me? What did I do to her? Probably because she knew you. Sort of. And probably because throwing that demon off to you was the easiest way to get away from it herself. After reading all this paranormal stuff, I've learned that knowing someone or knowing the victim holds a lot of power. Maybe the spirits or demons can read people's minds when they summon them. I didn't find any clear answers on that, but it seems to be a running theme throughout most of the lore. I said nothing. This was all too much for me. Too much to process at once. I was still in shock after all. So critical thinking was difficult at the moment. Jules yawned, closed her laptop, and placed it on the table. Ugh, I need a break. I'm hungry. Are you hungry? I said yes, and she happily walked off into the kitchen. I'm craving bacon. You want breakfast? Oh, hell yes. I am famished. Well then, the chef is in. Sit back, relax, and I'll whip us up some grub to shove down your neck. As she was preparing the food... I switched on the TV. I turned to the channel guide and looked through it. Nothing on this time on a Monday morning. I finally turned it onto the news and half listened to it. My mind beginning to replay the events of last night. I went through it step by step. I kept thinking I was missing something important, but I couldn't figure it out. My mind would go back to poor Jojo in the living room and how that thing had consumed her. This couldn't be real, I thought. It's all a bad dream that I can wake up from. Jojo can't be dead. This demon thing couldn't be after me. None of this can be real. Yet, there was that nagging feeling I was missing something damn important. What was it? Every time I drew near an idea, my mind would wander off to something else. Like the sound the thing made or how it smelled. I couldn't focus at all. The handprint on my mirror. The whispering. Damn it! What was missing? I grew frustrated at myself. My mind was like a thick soup with chunks of memory floating just at the surface. Randomly bobbing up and down. I couldn't hang on to one memory long enough to examine it before a different memory pushed it out of the way. Jules finally finished breakfast and brought my plate into the living room. Bon appetit. She said that as she handed me a plate with a large glass of orange juice. She'd cooked eggs, toast and shit tons of bacon. God, I loved this girl. She walked back into the kitchen and returned with her plate. She sat next to me, and we both ate in silence watching the news. When we finished, she took the dishes back to the kitchen and loaded them into the dishwasher. I need a shower. You want to join me? 
she said with a wry smile. I thought about it for a moment. Maybe some sack time would do me good. Certainly couldn't hurt. I needed to de-stress. That much was obvious. While it may seem strange to you, having someone this very moment seemed like the best medicine in the world. I needed her. I needed to hold her. To be held. And I needed relief for a little while. To get away from all this craziness. This insanity. Now that you mention it, I smiled back and followed her into the bathroom. We made love all morning and into the afternoon. We slept off and on for a while and then went back to our lovemaking. It was beyond wonderful. It was heaven. A small bit of beauty in a world filled with darkness and pain. Later on, we showered again. It was late afternoon, early evening, when we finally returned to the living room. The TV was still on, but some vapid talk show was ending, and neither of us paid it any attention. Jules sat back down on the sofa and retrieved her laptop. She said that she had more research to do, and dove right into it. I, on the other hand, was still trying to get my head wrapped around everything that had happened. Still, I had that nagging feeling. I was missing something important. I decided to go through all of the events in order from the beginning. I leaned forward and took a notepad and pen that Jules had left on the coffee table. I needed to write this down so that I can actually see it, I thought. It might help me figure this out. Okay. First, Jess moved in. I wrote that down. Strange goth girl. Wrote that down. Soon after, the chanting, then the orgy, and the chanting, and Jojo acting weird and skittish all the time. I wrote all this down in descending order. The breaking and Jess moving out. The bathroom incident with the handprint on the mirror and the whispering. Wait a minute. Why didn't I... That was the name I decided to give it. Attack me then. Was it not powerful enough? Or was it just messing with me? I wrote that thought down on the side. To think about it later. Then finding Jess had moved out. Discovering the letters with her name and social number. Finding the Salem cross. Wax and blood under her bedroom carpet. Finding the mirror shard, hair and urine in my apartment. And then, the attack. The only thing I hadn't questioned was why didn't I materialize and attack me in the bathroom? Not the eureka moment I was hoping for, but it was something. I told Jules about this, and she looked perplexed. Maybe because it didn't have the power to materialize yet? I've read in several places that spirits have to gather up energy before they do that or manipulate our surroundings. Electronics, especially battery packs, will drain out unexpectedly just before spirits do something. Let me check on that. She said that and returned to typing on her laptop. I continued on writing things down. So I went to bed tired and pissed off at finding all that disgusting crap in my apartment. The police were not home. I was angry mostly at being violated. And I tried to sleep. But Jojo woke me up by jumping on my bed. I heard I in the kitchen. Heard a crash. And saw it. I attacked me. And I slammed the door. And it pushed through. I then threw my watch at I and... <gasps> That's it! I forgot about that. I furiously wrote all of this down, nearly tearing the paper. My watch seemed to hurt it. Why? Electronics didn't seem to do anything to it. It passed the fridge, dishwasher, and lights without a bad reaction. What was it then? What was it about watches that it didn't like? Let's see. It had a glass face. Was that it? No. 
glass was all through my apartment. Plus, the mirror was basically glass, and it didn't seem to have harmed it when it left the handprint. What else? Metal? Oh, I don't think so. It didn't have any trouble at all trying to open the door handle on my bedroom door. The planets on the face and the painted star in the middle? Why would that have harmed it unless... No. Wait a second. Silver! The damn watch was plated in silver. And the crash in my kitchen? My utensils were silver plated too. They were a housewarming gift from Jules when I first moved in. That's it. It had to be. I must have sensed the silver plating from the utensils and threw them away from itself. And when my silver plated watch made contact with it, it screamed and recoiled in pain. Holy shit. That has to be it. Could it really be that simple? Really? Then Jules starts to read something off her laptop. Spirits sometimes pull energy from our world in order to take physical shape or to manipulate the environment around it. The energy can take the form of electricity from batteries, lights or other equipment. It can pull heat from the very air making their presence known by an ice cold wave in a room or outside a building or home. Lastly, spirits can pull energy from emotional responses such as anger, fear, confusion, sadness and even thoughts themselves. Negative energy can easily be absorbed by spirits that are dark or angry to begin with. Loving spirits, such as deceased family members, tend to respond only to pleasant past memories of the survivors or friends. Even pictures of past events can provide energy for spirits to materialize. Emotion seems to be the most powerful for some spirits, while energy from electrical devices seem to suit other spirits. There you are. Were you angry when you were taking that shower, that first time you heard it? No, I don't think so. I... Yes. Yes, I did. That was the next morning after I found Jojo locked outside my apartment. I was furious when I found her. Then, when I was showering... It was hot in there too. Then that's when I felt the blast of cold air. Looks like you have your answer then. Great work, honey. Now, let's find out why it seems to be sensitive to silver. I then explained about the utensils and the watch. I'm on it. I realized I was starting to feel better. Not a lot, but better. I felt that I was starting to get a handle on all of this. That was the engineer part of me. Engineers are an odd lot. If we don't know something, it just kills us. We have to get to the bottom of any mystery, and we won't stop until we do. It just bothers us not knowing something. Jules mentioned that she was hungry again, and for me to order a pizza. Not a problem. I was hungry too. The pizza came, and we finished it off pretty quickly. I put a movie on Netflix, but Jules was way too involved with her research at the moment to pay it any mind. She was loving this. It gave her a thrill to go out on the net and track things down. She was a natural detective. I guess that was yet another reason we got along so well. The sun finally set. A night fell upon the world. I was tired, but Jules was like a machine. She kept going and going, trying to find something related to spirits and silver. She made several comments about how werewolves were not the only thing sensitive to silver. Damn it. And then she finally announced she had found something big. It isn't set in stone or anything, but it's just about the only thing not werewolf related. I managed to find a site which goes around finding these old folk tales from past civilizations and translates them to English. There is one from ancient Persia about genies which is not what we have here, and another one from an old Polish legend. The creature isn't what's interesting, it's how to defeat it that is. It doesn't fit perfectly, but there are some similarities. Peklink also spelled Pekel Naibo, Pekel Naipan, Pekel Nick, Lockton, 
was a Catholic deity of the Slavic mythology. He was the lord of the underground and a divine judge. Peklink mastered the subterranean fire by which metals and precious stones were forged. He also reigned over the underground water, which, according to ancient Slavic traditions, caused earthquakes when Peklink ordered it to reach the surface. Peklink had a wholesale knowledge about the deeds of wicked who were carried next to him to be judged and punished. He was a severe, though equal, judge as he provided everybody with the possibility to redeem their past mistakes. The ones who persisted were condemned to death or condemned to punishments, depending by their crimes. The cruel were turned into stones and the quarrelsome became werewolves, while the ones who had no compassion towards others were turned into creatures feeding on their very bodies. Peckling was also capable of punishing entire peoples by opening deep ravines that swallowed villages and cities, a pond or a lake was left in their place. The inhabitants paid for their punishment by wandering underwater, their desperate screams being transmitted by Oswina, the goddess of Echo. Peklink also sent evil spirits against unjust governors in order to have them abandon their reigns. The latter, ruined and covered by black grass, returned to nature. He could also use basilisks as emissaries or servants. The line that made me take notice was, while the ones who had no compassion towards the others were turned into creatures feeding on their very bodies. That certainly sounded familiar. Honestly, I had no idea what the hell I was, or where it came from. But this did sound like it in a way, and it was most definitely afraid of silver. That was the key. I was convinced of that. Could that thing be a basilisk? Dunno. Maybe. Or maybe it could be an evil spirit ruled by this Peckling guy. I really have no way of knowing. Well, the site does describe using a silver box to entrap the spirit. It says there are ritual runes that must be inscribed on the box for it to work. There is a PDF showing these runes. I'll download it. Is the box connected to Peckling or one of his spirits? I inquired. The site doesn't mention that. Only that a silver box can entrap the spirit. That's it. It goes on about other deities and such, but that's all there is about silver. Sorry. Hmm. Might be worth giving it a try. It made sense about trapping eye in a silver box. But I didn't know about those runes. But what the hell? Might as well put them on there as well. Couldn't hurt, right? Now. Where the hell was I going to find a silver box? And I wanted a real silver box. Not silver plated. A hundred percent silver. I wanted to trap this bastard for good. Silver plating may not be enough to trap it forever. I asked Jules to try and find a shop around Nashville who sold solid silver boxes. There wasn't much luck. At this point, we were both tired and needed sleep. I told her that we could spend the next day going around the countless antique shops in the Greater Nashville area to try and find a box there. Sounds like a plan. Ugh. I'm tired. Let's go to bed, sweetie. The next morning, I was starting to feel like my old self again. Maybe it was because I was starting to get a handle on what I was going to face and how to deal with it. Would the silver box work? Honestly, I didn't know. But it was damn sure better than having no plan. And that did make me feel somewhat better. Jules was her typical happy morning riser self. By the time I woke, Jules had already had breakfast and was nearly done. I took a quick shower and realised I didn't have any clothes other than a few pieces I had left here in the past. I'd shown up in my boxes two nights ago and had worn nothing else since. 
I found an old pair of yard jeans I had left after a camping trip we had last year. I had a blue button-down shirt there as well. So that went on. Shoes? No shoes. But Jules did have a pair of black flip-flops that very nearly fit me. So they went on. I didn't have socks anyway. And when I stepped out into the living room, Jules saw me and laughed. She said that she had been wondering what I was going to wear for the day and had picked out a rather nice yellow spring dress that would highlight my eyes. I laughed, struck a runway pose, then sat down on the sofa and chomped down my breakfast. We started our quest downtown, walking to many different antique shops that ran all along the riverfront and 2nd Avenue area. Nothing. We did find one box that was silver, but after I covertly scratched the bottom, I discovered it to be a cheap, plated, and quite frankly, overpriced box. So we soon expanded our search to more outlying areas around the greater Nashville metro area. There were plenty of shops to search, but again nothing. By this time, it was well after 1pm and I was starting to get worried that we wouldn't find a silver box at all. Jules then said that we should try Franklin, her hometown. The old town square was absolutely riddled with antique shops, mostly specialised in hard-to-find artefacts. Thirty minutes later, we found a parking spot and started our search out yet again. In the third shop, we hit Pader. Jules found an old 19th century silver jewellery box that fit the bill perfectly. Except there was a wind-up dancing figure on the top lid in the very centre. It was of a little girl in a dress dancing and spinning around as if she didn't have a care in the world. The chime was a simple device inside the lid and would be easy to remove. I didn't recognise the song. However, a thought crossed my mind about removing it. If I did, it would leave a tiny hole on the top lid, and perhaps I could use that to escape. I didn't know if that could happen, so I decided to leave the thing as is. Plus, the irony of having a demonic creature trapped inside a box with a little dancing girl on top made me smile a little. I scratched the bottom, and voila, pure silver. It was heavy and well made too. There was some pantina, but I didn't really care about that. The inside was lined in some sort of decorative red felt. It was worn, but I believed I could remove that as well. I didn't want to take any chances of I getting out. Hell. I didn't know if this box would work in the first place. If it didn't, well, I'd have to worry about that later. The price was extortion. Nearly $800. Holy shit. The shop owner said it was a genuine relic that had once belonged to the Andrew Jackson family long ago. I saw no markings on it and was about to call bullshit when Jules elbowed me and said that we didn't have a choice. We needed that box, so she said to pay the damn money. Fine. I agreed angrily and handed over my debit card. And just like that, the box was mine. The lady wrapped up the box with pink tissue paper and gently placed it into a decorative cardboard box with the store's logo upon it. She then put the cardboard box into a big paper bag with handles and placed it on the counter. She smiled and thanked me for purchasing the item and hoped I had a great day. Yeah, I replied sourly. Jules again announced that she was hungry. So we found a quaint little restaurant near the town square. While we were eating, I took the silver box out of its garnish wrapping 
and started to look it over again. The sides were basic, with no ornamentation. However, the legs of the box ran all the way up to the corners, up to the top of the thing. They were very ornamental with delicate curves and designs running from the feet to the lid. The lid was raised in the middle and ended with that little dancing girl. There was some design work along the edges of the lid, but that was it. Kind of basic by today's standards, I guess, and certainly not worth $800. But I now had my silver box, and that was a big step in the right direction, I thought. On the way home, we had a discussion about how the box was supposed to work. Jules brought up the runes that we were supposed to inscribe on the box. I was more concerned on how to trap I. Do we go in all Ghostbusters on this thing and simply leave the box on the floor, hoping it wouldn't see it and fall inside? Or was I supposed to trick it somehow? Would the box work? And if so, how would we know? God, I had so many questions, and no real way to answer them. Seriously, what the hell was I supposed to do with this silver box? I suppose I would find out soon enough. I didn't want to drag this out. I wanted I trapped and gone. Not only because of what it did to Jojo, but because I wanted my life back, damn it. I didn't ask for any of this. And I had a rage inside me, and it needed out. One thing was for certain. Once I had been taken care of, I was going to track down Jess and make her pay for what she did. I even thought about finding where she lived and opening the box in her house or something. I don't know what it would do to her, but I would make sure that bitch would pay for Jojo. So help me in front of God himself. Jess would pay dearly. I promised that. We returned to Jules' apartment, and she was all excited about getting those ruins on the box. She had always been what she referred to as a hobby girl. Her favourite store in the world was Hobby Lobby, with Michael's as a second close runner. Her dining room was crammed with plastic bins and shelves filled with an assortment of paints, inks, glues, plastic flowers, and about a thousand other knickknacks that she would use for making her cute, dainty little things. Her apartment and patio was filled with things like that, all of them very girly and very hobbyish. She rummaged through her bins and found what she was looking for. Here we are my handy-dandy electric pen. She plugged it into a small extension cord under the table and turned it on. It buzzed like a piece of paper. It still works! Awesome! And she greedily took the silver box out of its bag and placed it on the table. She found the printout of those runes and sat down to work. She was so excited about inscribing the runes that she had forgotten about turning on the overhead lamp. I flipped the switch, and she suddenly looked up. Oh yeah, thank you, Hudson. And went back to work. I went into the living room, and logged onto her laptop. I was wanting to see if I could find something about how this box was supposed to work, and how I was going to use it. Again, Everything I could find about it was about werewolves and such. Jules had bookmarked the site where she had found the room PDM. So I clicked on the link, and I used the search function at the site to look for Silver Box. And of course, it highlighted what Jules had found last night. I was wondering if there was supposed to be something such as a chant or words that were to go along with the runes. But I found nothing. There were other links that would take me to pages or sites with the words silver box. 
but there was nothing that applied to my situation. Just then, Jules' cell phone rang. She had placed it on the coffee table when we came in, and I was the closest to it. So I picked it up and saw the number. It was my cell phone number. I left my cell phone at the apartment when I ran out of there, and I had forgotten all about it. The phone rang and rang, and I sat there stunned, not knowing what to do. The number and my name on the screen stared back at me, almost as if it were mocking me. Jules asked me who it was, but I couldn't answer her. I was just too stunned to say anything. I shakily tapped the answer call button and slowly put the phone up to my ear. When I weakly said, Hello? There was nothing at first. Then I could hear that damn moaning and whispering in the background. And then a voice which sounded like a ragged whisper of ice cold air rustling through a dead forest of dry leaves. I stood up and dropped the phone to the floor. It landed face up, but the call didn't end. I could still hear that voice whispering. The price must be paid. The price must be paid. Over and over again, until a horrific scream of agony came through the speaker. I knelt down and quickly ended the call. Jules had stopped working on the box and was watching me. I must have had a look of pure horror on my face because she came over and hugged me tightly. I felt weak and dizzy. This thing was following me, taunting me to return so it could feed on me like it did poor Jojo. Looking back at it now, I can see for sure at this point, I was more afraid and terrified than at any time in my life before or since. Knowing that this thing, this monster, not from our world, was trying to get to me was too much. I couldn't deal with it. I felt faint and I wanted to throw up. Jules just stood there, with her arms wrapped around me. I think she knew what I was feeling. She was my rock in all of this. Without her, I don't even think I would have made it through. Not at all. Once again, God, thank you so much for her. It took me a while to settle down. Jules got a Coke for me and eventually returned to engraving the box. Jules had to work in very fine detail, as the runes were incredibly intricate. I spent the time sitting in silence, thinking about how the hell I was supposed to do this. To return to my apartment, to return back to that thing. It was as if I were a cornered animal, mad with fear, desperate to get away. My whole world was crashing down around me, and I couldn't stop it. I was a leaf on raging rivers, powerless to do a damned thing. Keeping my sanity was becoming harder and harder to do. I could feel my mind wanting to slip away into the chaos and the darkness, and to just end it all. End the fear, end the uncertainty, to stop the agony of worry. It was also very exhausting. I was beginning to become numb inside. No emotion, no anything. Just existing. My thoughts were getting cold. Like, well, I don't even know how to describe it. It was as if I wanted to surrender myself to I. Just like that. Just to get it over. No more resisting. No more fighting. Just a sort of peace. Like when a criminal was strapped to the electric chair. Knowing 
that his life was about to end. It felt like surrender, or more to the point, giving up on my life to end the struggle. Lord, was I tired, so tired, to just sleep for a while, to just let that icy darkness wash over me, and die to succumb to it, and simply sleep. I could feel my mind reaching out to it. I was on automatic, with no thoughts other than surrender and blissful sleep. My mind called out for I to come and end it for me. Suddenly, I felt a slap across my face, a hard slap. I opened my eyes to see Jules leaned over me crying. I was laying on the floor looking up at her. She looked like she had been crying for a while. I felt groggy and I tried to speak, but my words were slurred. I wanted to sit up, but I couldn't control my body well enough and ended up shaking, arms moving all over the place. So I just laid there on the floor, looking up into the crying eyes of my fiance. I had cobwebs in my mind, I was so numb. Eventually, Jules laid her head down on my chest and closed her eyes. I could hear her breathing and smell her breath on my face. I slowly stroked her hair, but my movements were jerky and clumsy. Ever so slowly, I began to regain motor control and could move with more finesse. Let me up, please, I said. It was hard for the words to form from my mouth, but Jules seemed to understand me because she crawled off my chest and tried to help me to my feet. As I was getting up, my hand hit something cold and solid just behind my head. It was the silver box. Jules slowly walked me over to the sofa, and I carefully sat down. She sat down next to me and held me still crying. I looked around, and I discovered that the living room was a complete mess. The coffee table was thrown over on its side. Everything on it was sprawled across the floor. Her laptop was near the window. Its screen still on, but now with an obvious crack running across it. My coke was now seeping into the carpet, leaving a dark brown stain. What the hell? Eventually, Jules told me that I started to shout and cried that I needed to go back home. She tried to stop me as I ran for the front door. I had smacked her across the face as she tried to restrain me, and I could easily see the red mark of my hand that I left on her cheek, now swelling up. She had small trickles of blood on her lips and chin from the impact. She then told me I began to speak in a strange language and went into a rage, trashing her living room. She then took the silver box off the dining room table and touched it to the back of my head, and I instantly stopped and collapsed to the floor, unconscious and convulsing. I had no memory of any of it. I immediately felt horrible for striking jewels. She said she knew it wasn't me doing this, but I could see the fear in her eyes. She kept looking at me like I was a stranger, and that hurt me more than I can possibly say. I kept saying to her how sorry I was, and if she could please forgive me. I was feeling weak and fatigued, so she helped me to bed. I removed my clothes and simply threw them on the floor. As I was falling to sleep, she said that she had to go to work in the morning. Her clients were going apoplectic, but she'd keep in touch with me throughout the day. And I told her that was fine. When do you plan on confronting I? She asked me with a worried tone. I haven't thought about that much. Maybe this weekend? Well, 
We had better be ready by then. What else should we bring besides the box? Wait. You don't think you're coming with me too, do you? The baby, of course I'm coming with you. You don't expect me to let you go in there alone, do you? Jules, I don't want to put you anywhere near that thing. You don't know how powerful it is. You don't know what it did to Jojo. Promise me, you won't ever go into that apartment again. I mean it. Promise me. My voice was too harsh, but I didn't care. I couldn't lose her. No way, no how. Stephen, I will not allow you to do this alone. I love you too much. I sat bolt upright in bed, grabbed her shoulders and shook her. No, damn it! No. You can't go in there. You don't know this thing. What it can do to you. No way in hell are you going. Do you understand? Do you understand? There's no way. She slowly rubbed the swollen cheeks where I had hit her and started to cry. I don't know you anymore. What I is doing to you, it's changing you and you can't even see that. I'm starting to be afraid around you, Stephen. Shocked, I hugged her tightly. She let loose and sobbed loudly on my shoulder, her tears and saliva wetting my back. I didn't know what to say. I never thought about this from her point of view. But she was right. I was becoming a different person. I could feel it deep inside me. I was using my fear and anger against me trying to destroy my life. I hadn't noticed until this very moment. I was constantly sullen, angry, worried and depressed. That wasn't me at all. That son of a bitch was using my own emotions to weaken me, to divide me from Jules and everyone I cared about, to divide and conquer. I saw that clearly now, like how that phone call had changed my behavior. There was something about him, something, I don't know what to call it, a psychic link maybe, who knew, but Jules was absolutely right, I had been changing, and not for the better. Just then, Jules' phone began to ring, and my heart stopped, Jules paused and looked at me. Don't answer it, please Stephen, don't answer. I said that I was sorry. But I had to. I have no idea why, but I just had to answer it. I was compelled and felt panic at the thought of not answering her damn phone. I was manipulating me again, no doubt. I got up, walked to the living room and picked it up. I looked at the incoming call. Yep, it was my number. I briefly thought about not answering it. But I knew that if I didn't, I would drive us crazy by constantly calling it. He had me, and he knew it. This was all a design to get me to come back to my apartment. I got furious at that thought. My helplessness and the pain this was causing Jules made something snap inside me right then and there. Bloody red anger welled up inside of me like a titanic wave that crashed through my self-control. I started to shake. I was so pissed off. I could feel my lips pull back into a teeth-gnashing frown. No more, you prick. No more. I have had enough of you. I mashed the screen to accept the call and put the phone up to my ear as before. Right there, I snapped. I kept thinking, no more, no more. All my pent up anger and fear was now flying out like a laser bolt and turned into a rage so strong, I gripped her phone hard enough to crush it. Screw you, I, screw you. What are you gonna do, huh? Call me up like a coward and troll me? Well, screw you, you pathetic halfwit. I'm not afraid of you. I will destroy you. 
I will screw your world up so badly, you crawl back into that hell that you were shat from. You are a worthless piece of shit. I will own you. I got you. I know how to kill you now. And I'm coming for you. You hear me? I'm coming for you, bitch. And my face will be the last thing you ever see, you dicktard. I paused to catch my breath. Just then, the most horrifying scream came over the phone. Instantly, my anger evaporated, and fear returned like a thunderclap. That scream, it chilled me to my very soul. I will never forget that scream for the rest of my days. It was so bad, so horrible, that all I had felt a second before was gone. Replaced by a fear so primal that I wanted to run and hide in a hole somewhere. I dropped the phone and just stood there, weeping and enshrouded in pure terror. Jaws came up behind me and wrapped her arms around my stomach. She buried her face into my back and cried. What are we going to do, Stephen? I am going to kill that thing. I swear to God himself, I am going to kill that bastard. After that, we both silently walked back into the bedroom and fell asleep. The next morning, I was woken by Jaws' home phone. It was a cordless phone which utilised the old landline at her place. At first, I didn't know what it was. She never used it. The only reason she had it is because it came bundled with her cable and internet. I groggily opened my eyes and found Jules to be gone. Oh, she had to go to work. That's right. She told me about that. I slowly sat up in bed and looked at the phone on her nightstand. She was calling me on it because I didn't have my cell phone. Made perfect sense. I took the phone out of its cradle and accepted the call. Jules' angry voice soon came over. Stephen, what the hell are you doing there? Huh? What do you mean? Damn it, Stephen, you called me and told me to meet you here at your apartment, and now you're back to sleep? What the fuck, Stephen? I instantly woke up at that point. What the hell is she doing there? I told her specifically never to go there. Honey, I don't know who called you, but it wasn't me. Get the hell out of there right now. Right now, Jules. You're in great danger. I must have tricked you. Please get out. What? Stephen, it was you who called me from my home phone. I saw my number. I couldn't have done that. I thought about that for a second. If she was right, then I must have found her phone number stored on my phone. Shit. Jules, listen to me very carefully. Get the hell out of there now. Please, run. Run your ass off. Just go. I'm on my way. All right, fine, Stephen. I'm leaving now. I'll meet you at the Tiger Mart down from your place. I'm so scared. What is happening? Okay, I'll meet you there. Just just get out and it'll be okay. I'm leaving right now. I love you. I said it in a panic. Her end just clicked as she hung up. I threw on my clothes, ran out the door and jumped into my car. Once again, I floored into and flew out to the highway. I-65 North was only a handful of blocks away from her apartment, and I Grand Theft Autoed it all the way onto the ramp, running red lights like crazy. As I was tearing down I-65, my mind focused on the call from Jaws' home phone to her cell phone. How the hell had I managed that? I certainly didn't make that call. At least, I don't remember making it. Perhaps I took over my mind again and made the call from her home phone. And that thought scared the hell out of me. Because if he could do that to me, then what else? I made it to Brentwood in record time, and sped off onto Old Hickory Boulevard, and made a beeline to the Tiger Mart, not two blocks from the entrance of my apartment complex. As I pulled in, I scanned the parking lot and the gas pump for her white Nissan Altima. It wasn't there. Damn it. She should have been here by now. 
I parked near the main road and waited. Minutes passed. God, I wish I could call her. This was maddening. Come on, Jules, where are you? I sat for a few more minutes, and I noticed police and ambulance sirens in the distance, but I wasn't paying any attention to them. I was fully concentrating on looking for her white Nissan on the road. Nothing. Damn. Another minute passed and the sirens went silent. I got out my car to get a better look at the traffic passing in front of the gas station. Still nothing. Jules, what the hell is taking you so long, honey? Please get here. More sirens in the distance. And right then, I started to get a horrible feeling. Something was wrong. Something terrible. Screw it. I got back in my car and pulled out onto the main road. I headed back towards my apartment and I was getting really scared. And I mean really, really scared. Something was terribly wrong. Jules should have beaten me to the Tiger Mart long before I arrived. It was only two blocks away. I pulled up into my apartment complex and drove past the front gates. My apartment was located way back into the complex and it took me a little time to get there. Speed bumps were prevalent. And as I got close to my building, my heart fell straight into my stomach. The police were there, along with the fire trucks and ambulances. They had the parking lot blocked, so I just parked my car and ran into my building, hoping that she had simply got stuck because the police had sealed the area. There were about a dozen people standing around watching what was going on. And I saw yellow police warning tape all along the parking lot and the front of the building. I started to cry with fear and panic. I ducked the police tape and ran towards the front entrance where my unit was. There were several uniformed police officers standing near the front, as well as a few plain clothed detectives and emergency personnel. They saw me running around the corner of the building and yelled at me to stop. I wouldn't. I couldn't. I had to get to Jules. I dodged around them and headed straight for my apartment. As I drew near, I could see my front door open and officers inside taking pictures. Just then, a very strong hand grabbed my left shoulder and spun me around. The officers tackled me to the ground and shouted at me to stop and surrender and I was handcuffed. I struggled and screamed to let go. One officer turned me over and stood me up. I was in full panic mode, crying in hysterics and generally a total mess. I pleaded with them to let me go so that I can see Jules and they exchanged looks. One detective asked who I was. I told them and I could see their interest was growing. I was led to the front of a squad car and told to lean against it. I felt weak and shaky. At this point, that's where my memory falters. All I can remember is bits and pieces. I remember being told my front door was wide open and Jules was found dead inside my apartment and asked if I knew anything about it. I threw up. I didn't know if I fainted, but I do remember sitting on the ground while the detectives took my wallet and thumbed through it. My mind simply shut down. As I said, everything was a blur. I was questioned again and again why Jules and my dog were dead inside of my apartment. Where had I been? Why was my fiancé alone in my apartment? And where was I during the past six hours? Wait, what? Six hours? I told them what I knew. I told them everything except anything to do with I. And I strongly remember feeling afraid to tell the police about him. They think I was crazy. Hell, maybe I truly was. I didn't know. It was days before I could remember anything firm. I had some memories of the police station and being relentlessly questioned. Then, I was in some hospital somewhere. I remember a hospital room and police guards standing outside the door. 
a doctor injected something into my IV. And then I had dreams. Terrible dreams. Not eating food placed in front of me. More injections. And more dreams. I found out much later that I was comatose, for lack of a better word, for three days. The police had brought second degree murder charges against me and then dropped them as the evidence they found exonerated me. For one, Jules' apartment had several video cameras mounted at the entrance and exits of her buildings, as well as in the parking lot. They showed Jules walking out of her door just after three in the morning, getting into her Altima and leaving. Using her cell phone records, they called her home phone from my apartment six hours later. The detectives also secured video from the Tiger Mart, showing me waiting there for five and a half minutes before I left, obviously in a panic judging from all the smoke coming from my tyres. Then, the thing that really had them in a tizzy was the condition of her and Jojo's bodies. I told them I couldn't explain. They knew I was in her apartment that night and morning. Phone records and video records prove that and the autopsy performed on both bodies showed massive dehydration, but nothing more. The pathologist report stated that Jules had died at around 3.30 a.m. of the morning the bodies were found. That upset the police because the call from her cell phone to her home phone came three hours later. So who called me? We talked for one minute and three seconds. Who was on the other phone, they kept asking. The call was made from my apartment. Who was on the line with you? They kept asking over and over. What could I say? I kept repeating that I didn't know. I just said her side was silent. A lie. But I couldn't tell them the truth. I had placed that call to me. The prick had already killed Jules hours before he called me. Pretending to be her. I was numb and in shock. Maybe that was why I believed it right then and there. Besides, I just knew it was true. I don't know why, but it obviously absolutely was. That psychic connection again, perhaps? They let me go due to lack of evidence, but firmly told me to stay in Nashville for the time being, in case they had more questions or more evidence popped up. I couldn't go back to her apartment, and my apartment was on lockdown by the police. So I stayed at my parents' home in Bellevue. They took care of the funeral and contacting Jules' parents, family and friends. I was simply zoned out during this time. Again, my memory fades. I remember Jules' funeral. It rained. I stood and stared at her casket. I didn't want to see the condition of her body knowing how horrid Jojo's body looked. I also remember collapsing on top of her casket and having someone gently pull me off. After the funeral was done and her casket was lowered into the ground, I stood there in the rain. People tried to talk to me, but I simply ignored them. I eventually was standing alone in the rain, my tears mixing in the downpour. I had never felt such loss in my life. My equal, my soulmate was gone from me forever. And I didn't know how to handle it. I was so lost without her. Jules being dead and gone was unimaginable. I felt the weight of the world on me. How could I tell anyone the truth? No one would believe a word of it. Memories of her and our time together flooded back in a rush. The smell of her hair. The light that shone in her eyes, the curve of her breasts, the way she spoke, our complete understanding of each other, the sound of her laughter. It went on and on. I was more alone now than I had ever been. Honestly, I didn't want to live anymore. Jules would have been pissed at me for wanting to die, but without her, how the hell was I going to go on? I didn't care a damn about anything. My family, friends, career, none of it. Everything I loved was in a wooden box six feet in the ground. Pop.
box. The silver box. The moment the thought of the silver box entered my mind, an anger more powerful, more burning than any I had ever felt before, began to well up inside me. It came from the deepest reaches of my psyche. It came from the depths of my very soul. The rage rose like a holy fire from hell, warming my body from my toes to my fingers. Everything began to tingle. When the heat from the rage hit my mind, it instantly burned the fog and sadness away, and left me with a razor-sharp clarity I didn't know was humanly possible. All that I was disappeared into a white, hot, boiling fury, which demanded retribution and justice. I knew then exactly what I had to do, what needed to be done. I stood straight, closed my eyes, and forced my mind to reach out to I. I knew it was there watching, listening to my every thought. It was gleeful in my sadness, loss and despair. Oh, I was listening all right. I could feel it. It was definitely there. I reached out to it and felt its shock and surprise at being contacted. It moved, aware of my presence. I could detect it trying to force me out of its mind. It pushed me, but I pushed back. Hard. It tried to struggle against me against my will but I had an overwhelming rage and anger and that gave me strength I felt it recoil then push back at me I stood there in the rain at the foot of my fiance's grave fighting against a hellish monster with my mind and I pushed I could feel I growing more and more angry with me it pushed back with force but I didn't care I clenched my fists and pushed back as hard as I could. It let out a terrible scream of fear and frustration in my mind. It let out a terrible scream of fear and frustration in my mind. When I felt that, I knew I had won. I knew that I could actually beat it. I couldn't stop me. It could only push me back. It couldn't stop me. I felt elation and joy knowing I was harming it. It could be harmed. It could be hurt. And in that instant, in that very moment of clarity, I threw a single thought out at I, straight into its endless black mind. Tonight, you die. And then, I relaxed and let him go. I reeled my mind back and opened my eyes. I was grinning from ear to ear. I felt such happiness. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to defeat I once and for all. I was going to make that son of a bitch pay for what he had done to Jules and Jojo. I could sense I was ancient, older than I'd ever known. But I knew for a fact that I would be the first one in its miserable existence that could harm and kill it, or at the very least imprison it. And I intended to do just that. Now was the time. I was full of energy and fury, and it gave me tremendous strength. The rain was coming down in sheets, but I didn't even notice it. I walked back to my car elated, almost jumping for joy. I had the psychotic grin on my face, and I could see in the rearview mirror when I got inside my car. When I saw it, the grin grew even wider. Something had snapped inside of me, and I would never return to who I was. I was a killer now. I was hardened like rolled steel, and I reveled in the power of it. Stephen would no longer exist after this day. The soft-spoken, loving, hard-working engineer of the past was dead and gone. I was now something different. I felt my fury, and I accepted it, wrapped it around me like a cloak, and I dove right into it, and never wanted to emerge again. This was power. 
I could feel my mind expand into the world around me. I closed my eyes, but I could still see. I saw the rain, the trees, the headstones. I could see everything. I could feel everything. My mind continued to push outwards into the world. I could see people everywhere and sense what they were feeling, what they were doing. I could taste emotion and I loved it. I knew I could push anywhere I wanted and that would make things happen. The rain was still falling all around my car, but I pushed against it. The raindrops were hovering in the air all around the car. I let go and they fell to the ground in a great splash. I saw an old tree nearby and I could feel the rough texture of the bark and the craggy limbs above. I pushed against it and it resisted. I pushed slightly harder and it bent backwards and with a loud crack it fell to the earth. All of this I could see while my eyes were closed. I had done this to me. Somehow, some way, I had changed me and I was grateful. Perhaps it changed me when it touched my arm as I was struggling against my bedroom door. Or perhaps it changed when it first called me the first time over Jules' phone and I blacked out. I didn't know. And honestly, I didn't care. I held true power now. And I would use it with full force. I had made a critical mistake when it came after me. And I think it knew it. I had escaped his grasp and was changed for it. Whatever the case, I was going to get my revenge on it soon. I started my car and slowly drove out of the cemetery. Oh, I. You are going to pay. You are going to pay dearly. I was going to turn the tables on him and make him run in fear. Justice would be sweet in mine, and I knew exactly what I had to do. First thing, I needed the box. It was still at Jules' apartment, so I went there. We had made copies of our apartment keys and exchanged them for emergencies or whatever. I still had my copy of her apartment door locks, and when I entered, it was obvious that her family had been there. Most of her belongings had been boxed up, but not all. It took me a few minutes of searching before I finally located the paper bag that came with the box. I lifted the bag and I felt the weight of the box inside. I began to weep as I took the box out of the bag and examined it. I could still see her fingerprints all over it where she had engraved the runes. I stood in the living room, looking at all of her things around me. I could smell her perfume, and memories flooded back of all the happy times we had spent there. My hands began to shake, and I felt like vomiting. It was almost too much to bear. I thought of what I had done to her, to us, and my fury returned like a hammer strike. My tears turned for anguish and loss to anger and revenge. I replaced the box back into the paper bag and took one last look at her apartment. I knew it would be the last time I would ever be there. I sobbed as I left and locked her door. I slid her key under the door, turned around and walked back to my car. On the way to my apartment, I kept reaching my mind out to I, taunting it. I'm coming for you, prick. Do you hear me? I'm coming for you right now. I could feel it stir. Its darkness grew. Not much time now. Can you feel me? Can you feel what I plan on doing to you? It's nearly time. I'm almost there. Do you have any idea? How much you're going to suffer when I arrive? It resisted and tried to fight back. I pushed him down and smiled. You make this too easy, I. 
Too easy for me. Time is nearly up for you. I pulled up to the front of my apartment and parked my car. I could see the lights in my apartment were off, plunging it into darkness. It was night time now, and still raining heavily. Time's up, asshole. I'm here. You're too late. Time to pay the piper. It angrily shot back at me. The price must be paid. I laughed back at it. Yes, you're right. The price will be paid, but not by me. Get ready. Here I come. I shut off my car, grabbed the bag and closed the door. I didn't want to get it wet, so I pushed the rain and it diverted and fell around me. I felt so strong, so powerful. I could sense my power growing by the second. Being this close to I brought my strength up to full. It was the source, but I was the weapon. I was giddy with excitement at the fight about to begin. Oh, how I was about to pay. I calmly walked up to my front door. I wouldn't need my keys. I gently pushed against the tumblers in the locks. It clicked back and the door slowly opened. The interior was dark. Good. The darkness made me stronger. And as I walked inside, I could feel a sort of pressure, as if the air was dank, like a warm soup. It was heavy and oppressive, and I closed the door and locked it with my mind. I sat the bag down on the floor next to my sofa. Even without the lights, I could see I had been busy. He had ripped all of my belongings to pieces. There were claw marks everywhere. Pieces of everything I owned were strewn about the place, and I couldn't care less. It could all be replaced, but Jules and Jojo could not. I come out and play, I've missed you so much. For a moment, I didn't hear or see a thing. It was hot and humid, and I began to sweat. Come out, pretty girl. Come out and play with me. I suddenly heard the whispers. There you are. It's been too long. Are you ready? I couldn't locate it, but it was with me here, somewhere. Ah. Shit, it was behind me. Before I could turn around, it hit me in the back, hard. Ah. I literally flew across the living room down the hallway and slammed into the far wall of my bedroom. My body cratered the wall. Only the studs kept me from crashing completely through it. I hit the floor in a lump, stunned by the attack, and I felt blood trickle down my neck from a wound on the back of my head. That was a good one, I. You got me there. But now it's my turn. I stood up and found I only feet away lurching at full speed, its bent and twisted arms growing towards me. I reached out with my mind searching for the silver kitchen utensils. There I lifted them out of the sink and hurled them at I, hitting him in the back. It convulsed a moment and screamed that horrible demonic scream only it can muster. The whimpering and moaning stopped, and it all went into full scream. It thundered into my skull, staggering me back a step. As I writhed in agony, I pushed against it. It started to crumple a little. Then, as if there had been an explosion, all the utensils flew out of its back like lethal missiles. Most thudded into the wall behind me, but one fork hit my left thigh and sunk deeply into it. I gasped as the pain momentarily weakened my resolve, and I grabbed it and forcefully pulled the fork out and threw it at I. It missed, but it was close enough that it moved out of the way. At that moment, I pushed against the wall behind me hard enough to launch me out of I's way and move towards the living room. The box was there, and I had to get to it. As I flew past it, I reached out with one of those arms and grabbed me. It flung me around above its head 
and threw me back against the bedroom wall again. I used my mind as best I could to cushion the impact, but it still hurt like a son of a bitch. This time, the wooden studs did crack, and I almost crashed through the wall. Again, I fell to the floor in a heap. I became dazed, and I felt more blood running down my back leg and neck. My right elbow struck a stud and numbed my whole arm, and it took a great deal of effort just to lift it. As much as I hated to admit it, I was more powerful than I had anticipated. It seemed obvious now that it had been hiding its true power from me. It wanted to lure me back. Maybe by making me think that I could take it. Now its power was fully open, and I began to worry. How? How could I have been fooled so easily? Did I know this whole time what was happening to me in my mind? Probably. It was quickly becoming apparent to me that this fight was no way near even. For the first time, fear began to creep back into me. It launched its arm out to me and grabbed me around the throat. It lifted me off the floor with my legs dangling, and I tried to push back, but it was simply too powerful, and I was in too much pain. It leaned towards me, its head only inches from mine, and I could see its eyes open, and it had many, some bigger than others. Each glowed red. I was so close to it, I could see a red fire dancing in each eye. Then it began to open its mouth. It kept opening and opening, one inch, then two, then six, then a full foot wide and growing. Inside, its grotesque maw, where teeth would normally be. I could see dozens of those worm-like tentacles dancing around inside. They moved with hungry excitement. Just behind them was a red, hellish fire. The heat washed over me like a star, and the smell of death made me gag. As it opened its mouth wider and wider, it said to me in my mind, The price must be paid. The tentacles moved towards my face. When they touched, they burrowed deep into my flesh. I could feel the icy coldness wriggle under my skin and through the muscle underneath. I convulsed in complete agony. I tried to scream but managed nothing but a single wet gurgle. I could see the tentacles come out of my eyes, mouth and nose. This is it, I thought. I failed you, Jules. Suddenly, I was back in Jules' apartment. We were lying in bed together, both of us naked. I was slowly tracing my fingers over her body, caressing her softly. I moved her legs apart and she moaned as I entered her. We made love. Her body moved in my rhythm, and it was passionate and loving. We kissed deeply as we both climaxed in unison, and we continued to kiss until she placed both her hands on each side of my head and looked at me dead in the eyes and said, Stephen, now! I blinked in surprise. I was back in my bedroom, awash in total agony. I was there before me, absorbing me. Oh God. oh God, yes. I could feel my energy being drained from me. I felt cold and more weak than I had ever known. So delicious. I had begun to envelop me and would be completely around me in seconds. I didn't have much time left at all. Eat. I lifted my left arm and focused every atom of energy I had left. I could see in my mind's eye the paper bag in the living room. Oh God, yes, it's finally ours at last. It twitched, and I pulled. The bag started to slide in my direction. Then the leading edge caught the carpet, and it flipped it over on its side. I screamed in my mind and pulled it with all my might, and then the silver box leapt from the paper bag and flew out across the living room and into my bedroom. So delicious. I was too focused on me to notice, and the box landed in my hand, and I flipped it open. I, sensing the silver near it, withered and released me. I dropped to the floor on my ass, 
still desperately clutching the box. I screamed in terror, and the runes that Jules had carved on the surface began to glow blue. Tiny sparks danced around the edges of the runes as they began to change shape before my very eyes. The runes would change into a different shape, pulse a bright electric blue, then change shape again. It followed this pattern over and over. The box began to vibrate madly, and it took great effort just to hold it in. I was desperately trying to get away from it, and the air around the room started to shift. It was as if someone had turned on a ceiling fan, and air began to flow into the box, stronger and stronger. My hair was now whipping in the breeze, the dark fog-like mist coming off I being drowned into the box. I screamed in terror as it realized what I had done. The force of the air being sucked into the box was like a hurricane now. Pieces of my belongings were flying around in the maelstrom and forced into the box. The sheets of my bed flapping like a flag, then tore off and disappeared. I was in full panic mode. Its legs were stretched out across the room being pulled in. He clawed at the walls in fear trying to escape, and I noticed small points of light appearing from his body and floating towards the ceiling. There were dozens of them. They appeared to be unaffected by the wind, and they slowly rose up and disappeared into the ceiling. At the same time, ghostly images of people were being pulled out of eye and forced into the box as well. One looked dressed in medieval garb with a beard. He tried to resist the box, but his upper body and head stretched inwards and fell in. Another looked like a Roman soldier. He too fought against it, but lost the struggle and was pulled in. More and more of these people were pulled out of eye, each struggling but failed. Men and women from all ages through time lost their battle to stay out of the box. They screamed, snarled and pleaded and cried as each were pulled in mercilessly. I himself was losing as well. Its legs were gone inside the box, and as was most of its body. It was furiously trying to stay out of it, its mouth gaping feet wide, and its eyes glowing a dreadful dread. It screamed and screamed, its claws destroying the wall near the bedroom door, as pieces of drywall and shredded wood were sucked in. There were more of those tiny floating orbs. They lit the entire room in a warm glow and grotesque shadows were cast onto the walls and floor from the light. No no they appeared more. to be calm, unnoticed by the chaos taking place. It was then that the box started to grow cold, damn cold. I could see frost growing along the edges of the box, then it engulfed the entire box. My fingers grew numb from the intense chill. An ice from the frost met my fingers and began to form on them too. The ice crystals grew bigger and bigger as they formed along my fingers and into my hand. It was a force of will to keep my grip on the box and the vibrations flowing into my hand became more and more violent and my arms started to shake with effort. The runes kept changing and glowing blue. I couldn't hold onto the box much longer. I yelled in frustration, and I was almost completely inside the box now, its arms stretched all the way across the bedroom. The force of the box was pulling its claws along the walls and leaving deep, ragged ruts in the drywall. It crashed and convulsed, thrashing about. And just as I thought I could hold the box no longer, the wall beneath I's claws finally crumbled into dust, and he was fully pulled in, screaming dreadfully. The moment he disappeared, the lid snapped closed, and the wind instantly stopped. Bits of paper, dust, and floatsam gently floated down to the ground below. Suddenly, there was silence. A dead silence. I trembled in fear, cold, and pain. But I had held onto the box. The figure of the little girl on the lid slowly began to turn and dance as delicate music played from inside. It started on its own, without being wound up. Slowly, it spun and twirled, and the music was the only sound in the room, and I watched it for a while. 
I then noticed two glowing orbs floating noiselessly in front of me. As they hovered, they began to expand. One grew into the form of an animal, one into the shape of the person. Ever so slowly, the animal one focused into a dog. It was Jojo! The second one. Could it be? Yes, it was Jules! Oh God almighty, Jules! She looked splendid. Better than I had ever seen her. She absolutely glowed. And she was smiling at me. And Jojo poured at the air. I started to sob and cry. And a long great moan of sadness came from my chest. Is it over? I asked her. She smiled and nodded, and I just sat there watching her and Jojo. I felt such tremendous loss. I want to be with you, sweetie. Please take me with you. Again, she smiled and shook her head. No. She and Jojo began to fade away. I tried to stand up to go to her, to touch her one more time, but my body was a wreck, and I was too weak to do so. All I could manage to do was simply say, I love you. She smiled and soundlessly mouthed, I love you too. Then they both disappeared into orbs again and slowly floated up and into the ceiling. Everything faded into blackness for me then and I was gone. It has been nearly one year since that night a lot has happened in that time. For instance, I've had five facial reconstruction surgeries, two spinal surgeries, and two surgeries on my left leg. Most of it was to attempt to repair nerve and muscle damage from eyes attack. On my face, most of the motor control on the right side is gone, leaving my face limp and saggy, as if I've had a massive stroke. There remains a lot of scar tissue, and my left eye is now totally blind. It has turned a milky white colour, and doesn't react as it should when I look around. My spine was broken in two places, but the surgeries had fixed most of it. The two sections have been fused together, so that they are able to support my weight, although my mobility has suffered greatly. My left leg has some nerve damage, but it's still useful only if I walk on it with a cane. I have to take medication to be able to control the constant pain. No amount of surgery could stop that, unfortunately. Doctors told me that I've lost about 20% of my sense of smell and taste. And despite all of this, I am still grateful to be alive. Things could have turned out much worse for me. During my recovery, I've had a lot of time to think and ponder about it all. Most of my questions, I will never find answers for. But some, I believe I have. When I was being consumed by I, I believe Jules somehow reached out to me and took me away from the agony for a little while when we made love. It was so real, so believable, that it was a shock when I returned to reality. I think she took me away so I wouldn't feel the pain of being consumed or else I wouldn't have had the state of mind to get the box and open it. I can't prove this of course, but I do believe it to be true. As for why Jules got out of bed at three in the morning is still a bit of a mystery for me. The best I can come up with is this. When I was asleep, I was completely vulnerable. I had just established his link with me. So it could have been easy for him to pass into me at that point, since I was unable to resist. Jules was curled up in bed touching me, and I believe I was able to move control of me to her at that time. Jules getting out of bed and driving herself to my apartment would have been impossible. I know she would have never done that. Once again, I believe I was using Jules to lure me back. My powers have also left me. I suppose being linked to I, as I was, the power came from him. But after he was imprisoned in the box, that link was severed, and I lost it. 
Well, most of it anyway. I can still sense some things, like people's auras or emotions. And I can also feel and sometimes see ghostly apparitions at times, making me believe I haven't lost all of the power. That's fine with me. During the times when I used the power, I felt as if I was slipping into something dark. A part of me wanted to create pain or gain revenge. And that is not who I am, or ever was. So I can't say I miss the power too much. And lastly, the orbs I saw come out of eye. I believe this to be all the innocent souls it had consumed. Since Jules and Jojo both appeared to me as orbs. And I believe this to be true as well. At least, they are finally free of eye. And have found peace. I also disposed of this silver box with eye in it. I needed to find a place to bury it without anyone ever digging it up. So I decided to bury it in a place called Long Hunter State Park. I took the box with a little girl still dancing on top of it, encased it in concrete, and buried it deep in the forest surrounding the park. It should be safe there for many, many years to come. It took so much out of me to dispose of the box, but it was worth it. I don't know how to get I back to the hell in which it came from, so burying it seemed my best opinion. I did take GPS measurements of the site, so if I ever have to go back and find it, I can. I buried it deep enough so that no one could hear the music playing out of it, which of course never stopped, even encased in concrete. As for Jess, well she's disappeared. I have several locations of where she could have fled to, all of them are out west in Arizona and New Mexico. So I am currently on my way out there to track her down. I have decided to give her one singular chance to redeem herself, despite all the harm and tragedy she has caused. I believe in forgiveness. Jules would have wanted me to do this. I plan on telling Jess everything that has happened and to plead with her to never try and raise anything again. If she refuses, then I will kill her on the spot. I have no choice. I will not allow her to bring another eye up from the depths again. I have a right to do this, I think. And it's much more than she deserves, really. Oh, and one more thing. I finally discovered what the song from the box was when it was wound up. It took me a while, but it's London Bridge is falling down. Go figure.